Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And I'm not gonna lie, this was a tough week for me to pull everything together. I had to cut an album at the very last minute because I just couldn't pull together all my thoughts on it. I think I need to let it sit for another week. And I still think I said way too much about what I did cover. But yeah, at the very end, I think I got something here. So let's get on the pulse. So we've got seven albums on the docket, but let's first go back and talk about from Cub Sport, Like Nirvana. So it's a pretty common observation within indie pop that while certain acts have made banks selling their songs for commercials, there are also a couple acts that almost seem like they built their material specifically for the marketers. And in my experience, they wind up really damn tedious to review here. On Rock Coliseum just last week, we coined them as commercial core. And initially, that was the impression I had about the indie pop and synth pop of this group, Cub Sport. The vocals were gauzy, the content was generally pretty Pretty thin and underwhelming. And while the grooves were generally pretty likable, if you wanted to argue that this band's production or compositional chops were more than just passable, you'd likely wind up grasping at straws. Well, pretty much all of that went out the window with this album, like Nirvana, which dove headfirst into scratchy, fractured bedroom pop slash R&B slash indie rock, even more than Muramasa did this year. But where that felt like more of an organic pivot given his content, this got there with some of the most inconsistent or outright bad synth and vocal mixing I've heard all year, with a sort of blocky, lo-fi auto-tune blending and pitch shifting that you would hear from somebody approaching these sounds with no clear idea how to make them work. You're not Kanye West, and even he can barely make the caterwauling through the auto-tune connect half the time. And what drives me so much off the wall is that it feels so obviously like an affectation about the worst thing you want on a sound that thrives on intimacy and homegrown authenticity. And that's not counting how the scents on Best Friends sound like a Patricia Taxon riff and ironically, probably one of the better songs here. But I also know what Cub Sports started making. This is hopping on a trend for them and not even doing it particularly well. And it's all the more exposed when they flip into the gauzy R&B moments like I Feel Like I Am Changing, which sound way more composed and almost similar to their old sound. That is until we get to the mall rat collab, Break Me Down, or the limp trap inflections of Saint and 18, which are more meandering towards inert crescendos that just don't come together. What's frustrating is that even if the writing is still painfully thin and the underweight, quivering love songs with some very homespun detail, I actually do think that frontman Tim Nelson is a good singer who can deliver some sensitive and potent cuts. He reminds me a bit of Mike Hadrius, but not quite as uniquely intense. And if you combine it to this sort of soft focus sound, I can see it working. I get why some critics really like this. I mean, I can hear the audience, just not at all me. Light 5 out of 10, let's move on. Next up from Mr. Wives, Super Bloom. This is one of those releases where I'm curious if I'm the only one who really cares. Yeah, Mr. Wives is gonna get outshone by the big releases last week, that's inevitable. But I was starting to have this feeling off their underappreciated sophomore album, and even with a big signing to Fuel by Ramen, it seems like a really bad sign when there's absolutely no buzz anywhere, or somehow even less from when you were more independent. But okay, I, I got the album now and... Ooh, it's probably a bad thing that upon listening to what frontwoman Mandy Lee describes as one of her most personal and emotive albums to date, a lengthy breakup project exploring the collapse of her relationship and her emotionality coming out of it, I'm still left so cold on what might be Mr. Wives' most anonymous album to date. And as much as I've given this band a lot of credit for their unironic big emotionality, a lot of that millennial energy, they have been hit with the silent majority label pretty early early within indie pop, some could even call them commercial core. And while previous albums I thought rose above it, thanks to the big splashy melodies, the high tempos, and decent enough writing, this album unfortunately sinks right back in with the pack. The tunes are more subdued and faded in favor of some sharper percussion and an increasingly limp and overexposed new wave rollick. A lot of the richer vocal layering is stripped back and it feels weirdly flat when it does pop up, and a a lot of the more slapped 
Dash Mixing that wants to imitate some of the ramshackle textures of modern pop across the board, or at the very least some of the clunkiness of that last of Monsters and Men album. Alright, look, when Mandy Lee's vocal timbre is already so close to a lot of what you're gonna hear in mainstream pop already, why are you diminishing her personality, have her doing less of the belting, instead going for a slew of Halsey rejects or wannabe Dua Lipa cuts? Hell, given how many other producers were pulled in for this album, I would swear the majority of these issues came through few by ramen studio notes. But I think my bigger problem with Super Bloom is that Mr. Wives' uniqueness, it came through in their colorful exuberance and singing into melancholy, bitterness, or a not particularly detailed or unique breakup arc, it's just not playing to their strengths if they're not gonna ramp it all up to 11, especially when the horns sound really chintzy by the time we do get the brighter moments at the very end. And then when you couple this with the fact of running really long at 19 songs, and as much as I really want to support a group I've seen live multiple times and has a lot of personality, this started to become a real chore to get through. It's decent at best, very light 6 out of 10, but you're not missing much. Next up, from Second in Command, Tell Me Something I Don't Know. So do any of you remember that rapper I briefly covered who had a guest verse on that unfortunately amateurish Grim Greaves album a couple weeks back? Well, this is his full-length solo debut, and yes, I asked whether or not he was sure when he put this on my schedule himself. I'll say this. I don't think his technical rap skills are bad. He can handle most flows, even if you can spot his obvious influences. He's decent at constructing rhymes, and even if I don't think he can sing, there are at least points where he's trying to sell some sort of intensity, which I do respect. I say trying, though, because nearly everything else goes awry fast, which kills any sense of atmosphere he's trying to convey. For one, the mixing and the mastering is a mess here. The volume of the vocal line is inconsistent, even compared to one of his guest hooks on Feel For Me. It's poorly layered, providing he gets any sort of melodic layers at all. And there's very little in the way of tuneful atmosphere on the majority of these cuts, leading to a project where the majority of melody is riding on his vocal line, which is a bad sign. Now this could be redeemed if the beats or instrumentals were of higher quality, but not only does it feel like we're dealing with stock instrumentals again where the vocals are just dropped on top, which is a common problem with bad or non-existent engineering in hip-hop, you need to blend the vocals, but there's also very little in the way of unique personality or anything that has serious impact for me. And that means you gotta go to the content... And look, I'm not the sort of guy who believes in cringe culture, but man, this album can tread up to that line with the vibe of trying to be self-referential and ironic and some of its detachment being above mainstream rap, until it defaults to similar cliches delivered rather straight-faced. For one, it opens up with him fusing together all the awful bullshit that a certain side of the aisle will say online and make a broader point about America, but without much in the way of cutting commentary along with it, it becomes a parody that could very well be confused with the genuine article, the huge risk that you can take with this sort of subject matter when you can't really back it up with the execution, because it's not really sold in a parodic way. And there's also a song where he's trying to defend his girl for her OnlyFans, and well, I think that's fine in principle, it also reminded me of when iDubbbz tried to make it public a while back, and it just provokes the wrong sense of atmosphere, especially against that acoustic guitar and flute combo that don't sound good at all. And when you also consider how horny the rest of the album is, it just feels a bit awkward. Or let me put it like this. I heard a few phrases and nerdy references on this project that I might use, both in reviews and regular conversation, and where I suddenly became very much aware of how try-hard they can sound if not delivered properly. And it pushed into my mind that if I was younger, less self-aware, and had worse resources, this could have well been an album that I'd have made. And then I remember that I did make an album in 2012 that nobody will ever find, and I don't like the parallels that I found with this, especially by the time we get the title track that tries to get way too earnest and raw and real, and between all the production and the overwrought writing, it doesn't come across well, and it sounds like something I would have made. So yeah, you can flow, but sorry, 4 out of 10, not something I can recommend. 
least not for me. Next up from Judicator, Let There Be Nothing. Hey kids, do you guys want a progressive power metal act that jacks Blind Guardian's harmonies but pairs it with weaker hooks, less impressive production, and lyricism that is somehow even clunkier? Now, normally I wouldn't be so quick to call out a ripoff, but Blind Guardian was arguably one of the first metal acts I ever got into, and between all the thrash flourishes, the obvious fantasy pulls, and somehow sounding a lot less fun, Judicator immediately had an uphill battle to win me over. Now, the fact that they are emulating something I really like, that is a positive, and despite some rather terrible mastering, I think their 2018 album was generally okay, which means that it's kind of a shame that this feels like a bit of a backslide, specifically towards a faster, borderline thrash-inspired sound that still winds up feeling derivative. Yes, I get that most people probably haven't heard Follow the Blind, given that Blind Guardian album dropped in 1989, and it wasn't really widely circulated or liked. I can argue that Tales from the Twilight World was the first of their projects that really clicked for a wider audience, but I have heard Follow the Blind, and I wasn't looking forward to an undercooked imitation of its sound that thinks that its prog slowdown moments excuse the utter lack of hooks. It doesn't help that it seems like the production has taken a serious step back too. The guitar tones are a lot muddier and lacking some of the bite of their last project. The drums have little impact and it can also feel weirdly sloppy. And while you might get some cleaner solos that'll jump off the rhythm sections with some admittedly good sounding bass guitar, they aren't accentuated through any sense of dynamics within the song structure to make them actually leap off the page more effectively, make these songs feel more distinct. But okay, fine. This is where you would look to the content, where Judicator ventures back to the Byzantine Empire and the African campaigns of Justinian under General Belisarius. Extra Credits did a decent enough series outlining that story in their Extra History series, but the angle that Judicator takes actually goes beyond what that references, specifically highlighting an affair between Belisarius' wife, Antonina, and his godson, Theodosius. And this is where there is a seed of a good idea in juxtaposing Belisarius' holy warrior campaign with his desire for retribution for his wife's betrayal, and what that cost of taking that life would be. Here's the problem. Both historically and on the album itself, there's not much of a dramatic arc here. As Belisarius ultimately steps away from all of it, takes no retribution, Theodosius dies of dysentery, and the war will just continue on. In an odd parallel, the story has the same underwhelming lack of dynamics as the album's production. Mostly because it's way more interested in the same pretty rote war imagery you always hear in power metal. And what's annoying is that there are some decent tunes here if you're paying attention, and even if this is derivative. Again, it's a sound I like, but when each of the last three songs clock over eight minutes, the better moments just do not have enough power to stand out. And as I've said before, the worst thing power metal can be is tedious. So a uh, five out of ten, take it or leave it. Next up from Imperial Triumphant, Alphaville. So, looks like in getting to the metal that I missed last week, we got some avant-garde black and death metal on the menu, where they lean pretty hard on the discordant clash and the abrasive texture to overwhelm the listener in punishing atmosphere. Now, forgive me for saying that even among a lot of the death and black metal I like, this is not normally my vibe nor scene, mostly because if they're going to lean into this, I'd prefer if there's going to be a bit more of a tune that's rendered implacable and monstrous by the production or the delivery. Delivery, not an increasingly overmixed snarl that's trying really, really hard to shock me. Now, I will say I got more intrigued by some of the jazz elements they were trying on 2018's Vile Luxury, with a lot of the horns to amplify that dystopian feel of New York City. And Alphaville looked like it was going to be doubling down on that sound and theme. Maybe a little bit slower, where the jazz elements and the composition came through just a little bit more strongly without relying on the crushing presence. Maybe even a little bit more melodic 
or dare I even say accessible for this sort of black and death metal. And I'll say this, the integration of those sounds does feel more seamless overall, but I also feel it might have come at the expense of the more wild and howling textures that were more unique and could make this so unsettling at their strongest moments. Here, the bass lines, the guitar patterns, they're embracing more jazz chord progressions, and while you still will get some of that simmering, guttural energy and a lot of that wildness balanced out against an archetypal New York state of mind, it also feels a little bit more measured and controlled, especially in how there aren't so many pummeling crescendos as you would just get sudden bursts of grinding discordance. And yes, that can lead to some really unsettling moments here. The barbershop quartet switching to the haunted jagged riffs and the ascending nightmare on Atomic Age, I almost say it's inspired. It's evoking a very certain age of nuclear paranoia. It's a highlight on the album. And following it up with the sorrowful trombones that crash into the blast beats of Transmission to Mercury, it's probably the best advancement of what we got on Vile Luxury in that sound. But I gotta say it, as a whole, I'm not quite sucked into the nightmare in the same way. Not helped by nearly every touch of synths or production gimmickry to emphasize the abrasion kind of falling flat. And that sadly goes for some of the content too. For one, Imperial Triumphant are doubling down on a very specific brand of retro-futurist hatred of capitalist decadence that they were developing on Vile Luxury, but you'd think they would play up the juxtaposition a little further. Or more importantly, not start referencing the supernatural of that dark allure of a toxic gilded age, which adds a layer of unreality in comparison with something that's more relentlessly bleak and human for it all, like say that last Proto Martyr album. But overall, all right, look, it's a potent and unique sound for the act, but I did find myself wishing that it was either a little bit more tuneful or just fully committed to the over-the-top crushing but very human nightmare at this project's core. I mean, preferably both at once. I think they could do it. I mean, it might be the city that never sleeps here, but not quite on top of the heap. Strong 7 out of 10, though. It's worth hearing. Next up, from Alanis Morissette, Such Pretty Forks in the Road. The reasons I tell everybody I'm fine even though I am not These are the reasons I overdo it there's a popular narrative, especially outside of Canada, that Alanis Morissette basically has just jagged little pill from the mid-90s, and then spent most of the next 20 years trying to recapture that magic, maybe even 25. And while the re-releases and remasterings of that album do give some truth to that, it's not the complete truth. Most because Alanis Morissette is probably underrated as a really interesting pop rock act. Half because her influence that probably runs deeper than a lot of folks realize, half because she took way more chances with her sound and production than many folks bothered to hear, especially in the later 2000s, and especially when she got heavier than a lot of people would expect, and also that because she's a legit great songwriter. No jokes there. Even if she's got a tendency to write herself into a corner a little bit and not always bring the best of hooks, I can argue that her emotionally evocative honesty and powerfully loaded feminist commentary was ahead of its time in the mid to late 90s, especially in the mainstream and especially on supposedly former infatuation junkie in 1998. Now, it has been eight years since her last album in 2012, which I'd argue wasn't all that good, but what do we get here? Well, honestly, both a fair bit more and less than I expected. And I want to start with the positive because Alanis Morissette is such a singular poet when she bends cadences to fit her unique vocal timbre, which if you got a specific fondness for a conventional poetic meter or flow of syllables, this will drive you nuts. But I gotta admit I like it because not only does it place emphasis on words in interesting places, but also because she's a great enough songwriter to make these flows stick into more unique songs. She knows what she's doing here. And there's a lot of soft focus piano ballads on this album, but they feel more unique because of Alanis Morissette's writing. And now she hasn't quite left the 90s in grabbing more jagged, minor chord inspired progressions. Maybe more conventional 20 years ago, if you weren't paying attention for the details, but they stand out more now, and I'll say that's a positive. And that also draws attention to the writing in a big way, where once again, she doesn't shy away from exploring the exhausted deflection from emotion 
emotionality and abuse that so many women have had to utilize instead of just realizing her flawed humanity, exposing it for us all to see, and showing that vulnerability. She's always had an eye for emotive complexity and very level, complicated framing, and it is on full display here for the better. From the weary string of miscommunications that she might have had with her husband, to struggling with postpartum depression, to lingering trauma that she's written about for years now. It's just maybe now a couple more folks will get the point. Hell, songs like Sandbox Love, they're exploring how to have a sexual relationship post-abuse, and there's a blur of complicated emotions and the gleaming U2S guitars somehow managed to cast. That's a relatively unexplored situation with new partners, but it's very relevant. But it also highlights a frustrating duality of this project. The writing is uniquely Alanis Morissette. If you're on board, it's thrilling and potent, but I'd argue only about half the album can pay it off, and it's in the back half. This is a function of the album being split between two producers. The first five or so songs handled by Alex Hope, who is most well known for working with Selena Gomez and Troy Sivan, the latter by Catherine Marks, who's worked a lot more with the indie scene and is thus more inclined to actually blend and work Alanis Morissette's unique delivery opposite some of the weirder, heavier guitar touches in the pianos. Alex Hope's production is sadly very flat. And while Diagnosis is an excellent song, it feels like he was trying to recreate a certain adult alternative vibe that might have matched her earlier years, or at least around the early 2000s, and somehow it winds up kind of worse. I'm not saying that Catherine Marks completely nails the production. I really wish the drums had more impact, especially on that massive crescendo on Nemesis. Honestly, if there is an album that works for Greg Kirsten, it might have been this one. But it's also more of a rounded and organic tone that flatters her more. But as a whole... Okay, look, it'd be easy for me to point out to say, if you like Alanis Morissette, you're gonna like a lot of this. But I think the larger problem is that most people have an idea of what Alanis Morissette makes that's more based on cultural memes than actual reality. And I think that's kind of unfair to an album that's a solid production touch-up away from being really excellent. And yet for me, extremely light 8 out of 10. I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. It has only grown on me and deserves a lot more attention. Check it out. And finally, from Creeper, Sex, Death, and the Infinite Void. I'm not gonna mince words. I didn't buy for a second that Creeper broke up after that late show in 2018. Mostly because it made no goddamn sense. They were on the rise, their tour and festival appearances were winning an audience off a great debut with a diehard cult following, cult in more reasons than one. To end it all that quickly, it would have been the sort of wasted potential that Roadrunner would not have thrown so much money behind. Ergo, when they started releasing singles again after having reunited, I wasn't surprised, but I was excited. But I was also left with the feeling that many folks might have already moved on if they thought that Creeper had broken up for good. A lot of people have short tension spans. And then the pandemic forced another delay at the worst possible time. In other words, this man had to really knock this out of the park. There was a lot on the line here, especially if they're going to switch up their sound too. And I would argue they might have stepped towards that in a big way. And let's address some of that change in sound first. I called this back on their debut, but more than ever, this album is getting kind of flat with the exaggerated hard rock meatloaf references, especially in how it pulls and twists across glam rock chord progressions with a broader array of bombast and even some interludes that ya sound yanked straight from bat out of hell. Hell, to touch on some of the content briefly, it even matches some of the hyperbolic storytelling where the earth will end in seven days, apocalypse will come down from God, a message delivered from an emotionless angelic anti-hero crashing on earth from beyond the stars, who then falls for a gothic heroine and then they spend those seven days running wild and trying to escape the corruptive ex of our heroine. In other words, if you're expecting the frenetic, hardcore punk side of Creeper, this is absolutely not going to give you what you want. But I will say as somebody who always appreciated their dives into more expressive, melodic territory that's more theatrical, especially with some richer orchestration that's slipping in behind them, how very Green Day of them, come to think of it. It's a step that varies their sound within the sound of punk, and for the most part, I really like that. But it even goes further. 
touches of rockabilly, some smoky alt country, the obvious callbacks to Rocky Horror Picture Show, all wrapped into some campy excess that, of course, is going to include the saxophone and some emulated theremin. And while this could all be so silly, there's a surprisingly earnest core to the sound, where the bonus piano ballad All My Friends winds up feeling thematically appropriate. It can feel like the end of it all right now, where a history of angst and pain might bind people together. It's not so much a moment of reprieve as where everyone is there together for it, and it's a powerful closer. Really, the only point I would hold against this is that, like their last project, they feel a little bit lean in both the unique lyrical detail and some of the production. I feel like a producer who could really fully amplify their grander moments, and I'm also fully aware that that desire comes from a more lush sound. Comes probably down to wishing they'd sound a little more like Kyle Kraft, but with a heavier theatrical goth streak, especially given some of their own retro stylings they're using now. But as a whole, you know, I don't think there is a single song here that is better than Black Rain, although check back by the end of the year, that could very easily change. This stuff is catchy and it grows on me. But I think I might like Sex, Death, and the Infinite Void even more as a whole. It's pure camp, but with a craftsmanship to make it last and have some real greatness. Solid 8 out of 10, you're out of excuses for sleeping on this group. I'm so happy they are truly back. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Again, I got a lot here. I'm happy that I got through everything. If you guys actually have comments, I'm sure I said something controversial. There's a comment section down there below. Have fun. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys are looking to get involved in my tumultuous scheduling process, link to my Patreon right over there. Again, tough times for everybody. Please don't feel obligated. But if you want to, there's the availability. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching On the Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.